Good morning, everyone. You're listening to Money Talks with Attorney Coral. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This show is sponsored by Columbia Savings and Loan, which is celebrating 100 years of service in the community this year. Um, I'm excited this morning because I have a special guest in the studio with me, uh, the chairwoman of the Milwaukee County Board of Supervisors, Marcelia Nicholson. Marce Marcelia, please say hi to Hello. everyone. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be back on today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we appreciate you being here. Um, before we go forward and, and talk a little more with the chairwoman, I'd like to just thank everyone um, because the last time we were here, Last time I was here, um, I had representatives of Port Washington State Bank on, and along with a representative of Columbia Savings and Loan, uh, Ms. Ngozi Omegbu, who co-hosted the show and co-hosted the home buying seminar that took place at Columbia Savings and Loan, and it was a big success. So a special thank you for everyone who attended. Um, there will be an opportunity later this year, two more opportunities this year for that seminar. Um, so we will hear more on that as the, the weeks to come. Um, there's also other Columbia business to get caught up on. Uh, this past Tuesday, Horicon Bank made a $250,000 deposit into Columbia Savings and Loan. Um, there was a very nice uh, press conference that was organized by Sandy Robinson and Faith Colas. So a special thank you to them for organizing that event um, in order for that check to be presented. And again, thanks to Horicon Bank for making that deposit into the bank. Um, and thank everyone for their hard work and efforts that organized that event and the reception that followed, which was catered by a restaurant known as Ready to Roll at 2238 North Farwell Avenue. So everything was fabulous. So just to bring you up to date a little bit, um, recently several of the directors, including the um, president and CEO of Columbia Savings and Loan, Mr. Ernest Jones, um, and several other directors went before a committee, a uh, part of a subcommittee of the Milwaukee County Board, the Finance Committee, to have them consider a resolution to support the state's only black owned bank. Um, it is the sixth oldest black owned bank in the country and it's marking this year 100 years of service in the community. So the bank in honor of those years of service is launching or has launched a campaign or an initiative to help 100 families to become owners by the homeowners by the end of the year of 2024. And so that is a segue as to the reason that the chairwoman is in the studio with me this morning. Um, there was a resolution that was brought before this committee and it was spearheaded by chairwoman Marcelia Nicholson um, supervisors Johnson, Cogs Jones, Taylor from District 5, Martinez, Mart Martinez, excuse me, Roland and Taylor from District 7, and I believe Clancy yeah. as well. Um, and that resolution passed the Finance Committee unanimously and then went on to pass unanimously with a, an approval by the full board of 17 to 0. So the county has passed the resolution to put um, $250,000 deposit in the Columbia Savings and Loan. And on behalf of Columbia, I'd like to thank you, <laughs> Chairwoman Marcelia Nicholson, for being a fierce supporter of Columbia Savings and Loan and its mission. So with, with that segue, I'd like to... Um, turn it over to you and, and tell us a little bit about that resolution and how you became involved. Absolutely. So, um, hey, y'all. Again, I'm so happy to be here and, and talk to all of you. And, and first, I want to start by congratulating um, Columbia on all the amazing things you're doing so far. Um, the fact that you're the states um, at this at this point only and first um, black owned bank and, and still doing uh, many incredible things is just, I think, something that we should all applaud. 
um, and continue to support. And I think, um, you know, that is my segue into why I decided to spearhead this resolution. I had actually done this show um, a few months ago. And um, I was so impressed. Um, I grew up in this community. Um, so I actually grew up less than a mile from here on 12th and Burleigh. Um, and so Columbia Bank is um, a bank that my grandmother banked with and my, my grandparents banked with. Um, they got some of their first home loans um, with Columbia Bank. And um, it's one of those things where you move out of the community and, and you kind of, you know, I'm sad to say you forget about it. Um, but then when I came back on the show and I was learning about what was happening, I actually left the studio. I went and opened my own account and I started talking about how else can I support um, this bank and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and that's when the idea came to deposit county funds within the bank. Um, the county uh, own, has funds, several accounts, different departments, and uh, we bank with you know all the major banks that we know that are household names, but we didn't have one with Columbia. So um, went to research, got that resolution drafted, um, did the work with my colleagues to get it introduced and passed through committee. Um, and I'm really excited. We're having a press conference tomorrow, actually. We're going to hand over that big check. Um, the uh, county executive, David Crowley, will be there, as well as our um, county treasurer, David Cullen. Um, and I'm just excited um, because I think this is just the beginning. We, we can and should do more. And I'm going to start encouraging other municipalities. It's historic. We're actually the first government um, to do this. And I'm going to encourage others like the city of Milwaukee and so on um, to do the same thing. That's great. And and I love what you said about um, you were on the show once before and you left the studio, yes. went straight to the bank yes. and opened your own account. And I was so excited. I got my, <laughs> my, uh, my past book and it's just, it was the coolest looking book and I actually have it on my countertop to keep reminding me of the work that we're trying to accomplish. So um, I, I did want to put my money where my mouth is and, and put my phone um, in a bank that's doing so many great things to support our community. Right, right. No, I think that's terrific. Um, let's back up a second because I want, I don't want to assume um, who the audience is and what they may or may not know or understand about county government. So I'm going to ask some very basic questions, yes. if you will, but it'll just help to um, just put into context who you are, why you're here, and why we're talking about the things that we're talking about today, if that's okay. Absolutely. I, I love to, to educate about county government. Okay, so. that's right. And I'm going to get to that because I did my <laughs> research on you and I have learned that you have a background in education. I do. I so do. We'll talk about that. Fantastic. But first, I would like to talk about um, what is the role of a county supervisor? What is a county supervisor? Absolutely. So um, when I talk about county uh, government and our role as county supervisors, I like to explain it as we do, um, you know, quality of life services. These are the services we, pro we provide services that people rely on every single day. Um, as a, a policymaker, that's what we do. We also set policy for for these um, these topic areas. So um, there's something we used to call, uh, you know, folks call it the city bus. Uh, but it's actually the county bus. So we oversee public transportation, all those public buses. We oversee that as well as the airport. Um, we oversee all your parks. Um, so the parks that you go and have your cookouts and your family reunions at, um, we oversee those and set the budgets for. Um, we also oversee health and human services. So things like um, disability services, um, aging services, mental health. Uh, substance abuse and so on, um, even things like um, energy and rent assistance. Uh, we also allocate budget for um, our jails, um, for our courts, for our sheriff's department. Um, you know, we oversee a cultural institution. So um, if you go to the museum, the domes, the zoo, I mean, these are really important um, services that people rely on for, you know, not only living and, and playing, um, but also being able to thrive um, in their respective communities. Right. So I see why you refer to that as quality of life Absolutely. services. Because that covers a lot. Yes, it does. Yes. So how many county supervisors are there? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so you have a uh, uh, 18 of us. So we all represent um, a district, um, 19 municipalities as a whole. So unlike your councils, uh, which are the like municipal um, governments, you have the city of Milwaukee, we oversee the county as a whole. So that includes the city of Milwaukee, which um, I represent, but you also have um, Shorewood, 
um, Whitefish Bay, uh, Cudahy, Franklin, Greendale. Um, so there are 18 of us total. We each represent around um, 60,000 people, according to, to census data. But we know how how that goes. Right. <laughs> um, and we uh, we meet once a month. Uh, we come together. We vote on, um, again, legislation and policies as it relates to those services and the operations of the county. Okay. I was going to ask, how often do you meet? But so it's a monthly? Yep. So we meet on a, a, a monthly rotating basis. Uh, we have nine standing committees, um, you know, like the finance committee, economic and community development, um, judiciary, um, health and human needs. Um, and then we um, we meet like uh, the first two months um, in the, the first two weeks of the month um, in those committees. And then we meet once a month as a full board um, to vote those policies up or down. Okay. Okay. And is the role of a county supervisor an elected position? It is. So we're actually in an election cycle. Um, and this is where I get to plug that uh, we have an election on April 2nd. Um, that includes your county board of supervisors, your mayor, your county executive, your alder persons and, and judicial branch and so on and so forth. But uh, we are elected on a two-year um, basis. So our, year, our terms are two years and we're elected in the spring cycle. Okay. Okay. And it's a uh, by district. So um, people ask me as chairwoman, like, can anybody vote for you since you're the chairwoman? No, um, I represent the 10th district. So my um, constituency votes for me within that district, just like the other um, 17. And um, we depend on you to, you know, do this work. So thank you all for voting. Sure. So what what are the um, boundaries of the 10th district? Oh, boy. So they <laughs> and we just um, got through with redistricting in, in 2022. They call my district Florida. Because it has a little <laughs> bit of everything and it has such, such a weird shape. So um, I represent the third ward. So I have the third ward parts of downtown. Um, I border the Pfizer Forum. I then go up the Marquette Interchange. So the Marquette campus and surrounding communities are in my district. Um, I then go um, as west as um, bordering Washington Park. I at one point represented that park, but um, lost it during redistricting. Um, I go north to Sherman Boulevard. Um, to Townsend. Okay. Um, so it's a large swath. I also have um, portions of 53206. Um, 27th Street is my boundary okay. um, on my western end. Um, and the third ward is my most eastern boundary. Okay. Okay. I thought that I had seen in research that you represented the fifth district. What was, was that? It was, was, it wrong? was the fifth. It, it used okay. to be the fabulous fifth. Okay. But then when they did redistricting, they, you know, they, they, kind of moved us over and had to change the number. So now I'm in the 10th district. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I understand now because when you were describing the 10th, I thought, well, wait a second, that's some of what I knew yes. to be in the fifth. Because right. I looked up what consist what it consisted of. Yep. And so it was part of it. So yep. okay, redistricting yep. changed some things around a little bit. Exactly. My first six years in office, I represented the fifth. Um, and for the last two, um, it's now the 10th and it's largely the same. Um, just, you know, it shifted a little bit north. Um, I lost some swaths of, of downtown, um, but it's, it's largely the same. And then they just changed the numbers around because of um, some 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 um, districts changed a lot more than mine did. And they just had to make it make sense. OK. Mm -hmm. OK. So there was another thing that I just wanted to touch on. Um, even though we're right at the tail end of Women's History Month. Yes. But when I visited your office yes. that time, you showed me there was like a 50-50. Yeah. E explain what, that, what, what oh, that's all about. Thank you for asking me about that. It, it, it's so exciting. And we actually just celebrated um, on the 21st this milestone. And I hosted a tea party um, last Sunday to celebrate this milestone with other women across government. Uh, but for the first time in Milwaukee County history, our board is now officially half or 50 percent women. So we're electing more women, um, you know, every election cycle, whether it's the city council, whether it's your first me, your first black black woman chair, um, you know, whether it's in the state government or, you know, the school board, uh, we're electing more women. And I think it's important that we we pause and celebrate that because. Um, growing up, I mean, I didn't grow up in a political family, really. And I never in a million years thought I'd be here. No one looked like me who did it. And quite frankly, a lot of women don't do it. 
um, until now. We're taking right. over, and Beyonce has this song, uh, <laughs> "Who Runs the World," girls, right? And right, so right. it's. I think it's important that we we lift this milestone and let you know girls across Milwaukee know that um, they can do this too, and they too can lead um, and help shape our community. So this is the first time in the history of the board that it's been fifty. The first women. time. It, yep, Milwaukee County has been incorporated since maybe eight. I think it's eighteen sixty three or something like sixty seven, maybe. And for the first time, uh, we're half women. Wow. So that that is an achievement in and of itself. Absolutely. And yeah. it's, it's no easy feat. I mean, this is this is hard work. Um, and I hear it all the time. I could never run for office for every, for every you know, rhyme or reason. But, you know, it's 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 important that, again, we lift this because it's, it's challenging work. It's hard. It's, it's quite frankly a sacrifice. And women are already doing so much in our communities. We're the caretakers. Right. We're right. we're the ones that people rely on and fall back on. I mean, even in the workplace, we're the one doing all the work, getting none of the credit. Um, and to, you know, have women be willing to step up and and, and face the public and fight. Um, in a world that was quite frankly not designed for us right. to do much in, you know, I, it is. It's an incredible feat, and I'm I'm proud of that accomplishment. Right, right. I'm proud of that accomplishment. Yeah. Too. I remember when you when we were walking through the office and you showed me the pictures, and wasn't there like there was a a color scheme, a pink or oh something? that pink and purple. That's yeah. my that's my favorite. Those are my two favorite colors, and it, it's you know I I I'm a I'm a very soft individual. I, I never felt like I had to play a part or a role to do this work. And I, I really do lean into that femininity. That's a so strength. So when you come into my board office, um, the, 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 uh, the walls is wall to wall panel, wood, uh, paneling. It looks like a, like a judicial office or something like <laughs> it that. Does. Um, and my chairs are pink. You'll see flowers, you'll smell perfume and, um, you're going to know who I am. Right. I'm a woman. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's power in that. Yes. I, I wish that more women understood that. You know, I think leaning into femininity is a strength. Absolutely. Because that's our God given nature. That's exactly that's who right. we are. That's exactly right. And I know right. when I walked in your office, and yeah, I, I've been in many judges' chambers as a trial lawyer, um, but I wanted to just hop on one of those chairs yeah. and lay down and take a nap. <laughs> it is. It's, it's actually become the place. It's like the safe place. Everybody comes in. I'm like, oh, it smells good in here. It's cozy. Yeah. yeah. Some of my staff, they'll sneak in, maybe take a nap on their lunch break you know they'll bring in their lunch and I and I welcome that because like you said women have such a unique um you know capability to just nurture people and bring people together and help them um feel safe and this work again this work is hard whether you're elected or whether you're behind the scenes of those elected officials um and again I, I just want to lean into that and, and let every woman know like it's so it's okay it's okay and and in, in fact um you know we're, we're our world is moving to a point where we can do that and not be ashamed to do it. Exactly. And I think that's a good place to go. Thank you. Absolutely. So I wanted to back up a little bit and talk a little bit more about how it is you came to the idea of advocating and supporting the corporate resolution for the for Columbia. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're so happy that you did that. But tell me a little bit more about how that all came to be. Absolutely. So when I uh, when I was on the, when I was first on the show I was with uh, Will. And um, when I um, went over to the bank and opened up my bank account, I was talking to staff and I was talking to Will and um, I was learning about some of the, um, you know, initiatives you had coming up, um, including the 100 year um, celebration, the centennial um, celebration of the Columbia Bank. And um, I learned about how you all wanted to um, provide at least 100 home loans um, for, you know, first time or new home buyers or home buyers as a whole. And um, I share my um, sort of experience. I, I purchased my first home mm -hmm. and it's been um, for me incredibly um, just I don't even I can't even find the words from it. Again, I, I grew up in a poor zip code in the state. I grew up on 12th and Berlai. I never imagined I would be here, let alone being able to buy a home. It's a wealth building tool. It, it, it has instilled confidence in me. I, um, I'm, I'm a member of my community. And I thought to myself, uh, I want everyone to be able to have that opportunity and there shouldn't be barriers to that. And um, when we talked about, well, what could Milwaukee County do between the two of us? You know, we're like, maybe we could put some funds in the bank. Like, have you ever, you know, had this discussion? And so um, I decided to take this idea back to our treasurer, who basically is the steward of our he holds our funds and asked them, what is it? What will it take 
for us to put some money um, into those funds. We talked about um, with potential amounts. Um, we came up with uh, 250000 to start and, um, you know, started having conversations with supervisors. And I mean, you know, I'll be honest, it, it wasn't, you'd think it'd be easy to just, you know, get this done, that everyone would just, you know, fine, let's do this. But there was some some apprehension from others. So we had some tough conversations. And you were at committee. Yes. Um, I mean, this came up even in committee where, and, and this is what happens too sometimes, whether it's Black business um, or, you know, just Black folks as a whole, uh, we're sometimes held to some, some standard that right. other banks are held to. And the question was, well, can this bank um, you know, be good stewards of this money, you know, are our funds at risk if we bank with this institution? Um, and I think, quite frankly, that was very ignorant, um, especially when you see um, these banks, you know, these white owned big banks get bailed out by our federal government over and over again, because clearly they're not taking care of their funds. And here you are celebrating 100 years. Right. So, you know, we had those tough conversations, um, but we, you know, came to an agreement, got everybody on board, um, and um, adopted it um, with the full board vote on the 21st and um, invited everybody out to the press conference. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So so we're excited. Yeah, no, I think that's great. So that helped a lot um, to just talk a little bit more about the steps that you had to take in order to make that happen. So I appreciate you, you know, um, elaborating on that Absolutely. a little bit because I was curious about how that came about. Yeah. You know, I'm a lawyer. I saw the resolution and right. I thought, okay, well, this is well written and this is yeah, you know, well drawn yeah. and this is, you know, just all the all those things. Yeah. And I actually had it um I had it scheduled for January. And um uh, because of all the the hoopla that was going on behind the scenes, I had to hold it. Um, wasn't able to introduce it um, in committee, but, um, you know, I knew I wanted to end this term with the bang. I knew I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was steadfast in this initiative. So um, I asked our finance chair to put it on the agenda for March. I, I reached out to leadership at Columbia Bank. I said, I need y'all there. You know, I need y'all to show up and show who you are. And you all did that. You came and you um, you know, Ernie, uh, er, I shouldn't say Ernie, uh, the president, Ernest Jones, oh, you know, yeah. but he, he would love for you yeah. to just say Ernie, <laughs> <laughs> but he came and he testified before the committee and that, that's no easy feat, you know, um, to, to do, but he did an incredible job. Um, you know, he, he shared the history. Um, he was strong. Y'all all were like, y'all mobbed up and it was, it was just really cool to see. Um, and the, the committee had no, no, you know, choice but to, right. but to accept this is what we're going to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad about how that went. And Ernie did speak very eloquently yes. on behalf of the bank and to educate the committee um, about who we are and what we're doing in yes. terms of going forward. And then the, one of the other directors, Steve Moore, was there yes. and he spoke as well. Yes. And I'm a person that like I was prepared to speak if needed. Yes. But I read the room and it was apparent to me that, you know, when you won, you stop talking. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So that's what we know. That's what we do. And I, and I do this. This is where I have to shout out um, Supervisor Willie Johnson. He's our most senior member. And he I mean, he's on the committee and he was not taking, you know, that riffraff. He he stood up for y'all and, and helped spearhead it through as well. So I want to definitely thank him and shout him out. He absolutely did. And I appreciated that um, his his support while we were there. You know, we felt how powerful he was yes. in, in his words and what he said on behalf of the bank. Yep. So we were we just felt very honored. Um, that he, he took a stand like absolutely. that on, on behalf of the bank. Absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. So I think it's probably time that um, we're going to go ahead and take a commercial break. Um, if there are any, if there's anyone that would like to call in and have a discussion with us, the number is 414-444-5250 after the break. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. March is Women's History Month. A lifetime of service to Milwaukee Public School students has led to an extraordinary honor for Joyce A. Hall, a longtime public school educator. On Friday, December 10, 2021, the George Washington Carver Academy's library was renamed in honor of Joyce, a teacher and volunteer tutor for nearly 60 years. We salute Joyce Hall during Women's History Month. 
This moment in women's history was brought to you by U.S. Bank. U.S. Bank has more than 50 locations in the greater Milwaukee area. Visit usbank.com to find a location near you. U.S. Bank, a member of FDIC. Increase in taxes while families are paying more for everything from gas to groceries is wrong. Milwaukee voters should oppose increase in property taxes by nearly 30% in order to provide increased funding yet again to Milwaukee Public Schools. They've already wasted nearly $1 billion in new taxpayer funding, and now they want more? They don't even have a plan on how they'll spend it. Enough is enough. Milwaukee voters should just say no. Paid for by enough is enough. Vote no. Get ready, Wisconsin. The Black Child Development Institute is expanding its village state. Join us for an unforgettable evening of celebration and empowerment at our gala on Saturday, May 4th, 2024 at the Hilton Milwaukee City Center. Tickets are available for $150 per person and sponsorships are available. Adorn yourself in formal African attire as we celebrate this momentous occasion and the growth of our village. For more information and to purchase tickets, call 414-236-5641 or visit bcdi-wisconsin.org. That is 414-236-5641 or bcdi-wisconsin.org. Don't miss out on this unforgettable event. Together, let's build a brighter future for Wisconsin's children. The Center for Teaching Entrepreneurship presents its third annual Big Head Soiree Thursday, May 16th at the Marcus Performing Arts Center in the Bradley Pavilion. I'm Andrea Williams and I'll be your host for this spectacular event. It's designed to salute the co-founder, Miss Radonna Rogers, as she loved to wear big hats and this is one way we honor her. We will also celebrate and recognize the accomplishments of Milwaukee's leaders in entrepreneurial ventures. TTE was founded with the mission in mind to help young people understand business, financial literacy, and themselves, and how they can find their way into the marketplace and be productive citizens. We have found a great way to educate, stimulate, and advance what we're doing within this community. So ladies, this is the time to wear your big hat and guys, your stylish fedora. You will be treated to a delectable dinner and the sounds of Soul Serious starting at 5.30. The program will begin at 7 with more entertainment and the awards program. Tickets are just $75. Go to Eventbrite using VHS24 or call 414-788-8104. That's 414-788-8104. This event will kick off the spring season, so don't miss it. This event is sponsored by Wisconsin Black Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Bank, Brewers Community Foundation, and BizStart. WNOV 860 and W293CX 106.5 Milwaukee. Milwaukee. Welcome back to Money Talks with Attorney Coral. I have a guest in the studio this morning, the uh, chairwoman of the Milwaukee County Board, Marcelia Nicholson. So welcome back. Thank you. Thanks again for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. So in the first segment, you were talking a little bit about your background, saying that you grew up in the 12th and Burleigh yes, area. In, not far from here. Not far from where we are right, right now. So I wanted to just talk about your um, background a little bit. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your family, brothers yeah. and sisters, that sort of thing. Oh, man. So, yep. So I am I'm a product of Milwaukee um, and a proud product of Milwaukee. Um, I grew up on 12th and Burleigh. So a little bit about my family. Um, my grandparents are from the South. Uh, my grandma originally from Mississippi and my grandpa originally from Alabama. And um, they, like many other black families from the South, migrated up to the North. And uh, my um, grandparents both um, retired from manufacturing jobs. You know, we used to have those good paying manufacturing jobs. My grandpa, Rex Nord. And my grandma um, was, which was then the American Motors Company. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, and that so. That used to be on Capitol Drive. Exactly. Like Capitol Drive. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. 
And um, so my my dad is is one of eight. Um, my my mom is Puerto Rican, actually. And um, her uh, mom also migrated from Puerto Rico to Wisconsin for that factory, that factory work. So she did a, a factory job on the south side is where my grandma, my, my mom grew up and her and my dad met, um, hit it off. Uh, my mom is actually, um, if you saw her and my and my dad, you would know which one was the the, the Latino because <laughs> my dad has long curly hair. Oh, okay. And my mom is considered morena. Like, she's darker than I am. Oh. Right? She's like black Puerto Rican, like Afro-Latina. Okay. Um, and so for that reason, my, my mom hung with all the black kids. <laughs> so she fit right in. That she fit right in. That's right. She didn't fit in with her own community, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, she met my dad and um, then they had me um, and my two brothers. Um, so I uh, grew up on Totham Burleigh. My grandma wasn't far away from here either. She was on 23rd and Keith. Okay. Yep. And so we would spend our time, um, you know, walking. I was just showing my, my staff member here the graveyard that we would walk across. Um, to get to you laughing, right, yeah, to right exact, on, on yeah, right there on Titonia. Oh, yeah. We yeah. would walk through that graveyard to get to our grandma's house because it through the graveyard. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, well, we weren't scared. Okay, yeah. you grew up on Totham Burleigh. You're not scared of nothing, <laughs> right? He did it too. So, <laughs> no, I was scared. My you were scared. Was, I wasn't from there like that. My cousin okay, was like, come on, man. Yeah, the it's a shortcut. At yeah, twelve at night. It, it, we, well, we used to go in there, you know, like the older kids when we were little and we were trick or treating. Yes. and they would take us in there to oh, just scare wow. us, oh, just Lord. to shake us up, uh -huh. and then we would go get the candy. Got it. So I know just what you mean. Yes, and it's funny because you know when we were on break and you mentioned that you went to the school of languages, yes. and I said, oh, I bet you know my niece Hope yes. Daniel. Hey, Hope. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Shout out to Hope if she's listening. But with your grandma having worked at American Motors, yes. my mom worked at American wow. Motors. And that's how I knew where the plant used yep. to be yep. on, on East Capitol yep. Drive. Yep. Funny story, my the car, one of the cars that she built is called a, a, a Ambassador, a Rambler Ambassador. My dad's an antique collector dealer. He actually found the car um, and gifted it to me. Um, this old school classic car, a 67 Ambassador Rambler that she helped build. I'll show you some pictures on break. <laughs> yeah, you have to show yeah, us. Yeah, I absolutely will. And I mean, our, look, you know, I, I'm I'm blessed in that I, I grew up in a two parent household. My my parents were uh, married. Um, my dad uh, worked at Milwaukee Public Schools. Um, so uh, he was an, um, an aide with Milwaukee Public Schools. And my, my mom started off as a, a cafeteria worker, actually with MPS and it's still now to this day, my dad retired uh, five years ago. Um, but my mom, um, is a safety assistant. Oh, yeah. Wow. Um, okay. she's at the, she, she's little, my mom's like five, one and they will put her at, like Washington high school. Yeah. And the kids would be like, Miss Nicholson coming. And they will run <laughs> the class because she didn't play that. <laughs> oh, she, you know, she's yeah. little, she's little, but she's mighty, <laughs> you know, she packs a punch. So, um, so I grew up actually, you know, after school programs, Parkman, you know, my dad would do after school programming there when he worked there when it, oh, I guess it's Andrew S. Douglas now. Um, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, so uh, and that kind of helped, I think, shield me from a lot of the stuff that was happening, because when my grandparents moved into the community, again, you had all these big, you know, you had these factory jobs, these manufacturing jobs. And then all of a sudden those all those jobs left. Mm -hmm. And they went to the suburbs or they went overseas and, you know, and then now we have some of the largest unemployment um, in the nation. Right. And so me growing up, I was a victim of that sort of, you know, those those statistics, the the gun violence. I heard gunshots at night. The gang activity uh, moved in. You know, you will see drug deals happening and, you know, being able to go into those after school programs, um, spending time at my grandma's house with all my cousins. It really shielded me right. um, from a lot of that. And um, so that's when I uh, I grew up, um, uh, started working uh, around 15. And I thought, well, I'm going to just work. And mm -hmm. wasn't really thinking about college, to be honest. Not that I wasn't a bright. I was actually a very bright child. I was always in, like, you know, the special the special groups. And I always read very well um, at a at an early age. Um, but I just, it didn't, it, I wasn't surrounded by it. My, my parents hadn't gone to college. No one I knew in my family had gone to college. And um, it was my teachers who were like, what are you doing? Like, mm -hmm. you're skipping class to go to work. You know, you haven't um, you, ha you haven't seen your ACT application. Where are your college applications? Mm -hmm. And it was actually my guidance counselor um, at Milwaukee School of Languages. Actually, so I went to Ben Franklin. Uh, then I went to Samuel Morris. Shout out to Dr. Onik. 
<laughs> and then I, I went to uh, Milwaukee School of Languages and it was actually my goddess counselor who um, encouraged me to apply for my and, and she paid for my ACT test. Oh, wow. And she helped me apply for colleges. She helped um, get me those fees waived. Right. Because I didn't have money like that, you know. Right. And um, I tested well. I mean, I, you know, I tested well. I got scholarships. Right. So I, I was so glad that she forced me to do that. But like, that's not the end of the story because um, when I was seeing the price tag, the scholarships weren't full scholarships. But when I was seeing the price tag and my parents saw the price tag of school, they're like, maybe you should just go to UWM. It was a little cheaper and it was fine. Look, I had a great education at, at UW Milwaukee. I'm proud to be a Panther. Mm -hmm. um, but when I got to campus, I didn't know what to do. Right. You know, it's, we forget that part that like when you don't have folks who can you know guide you through that every step of the way you you're pretty much left to figure it out on your own i'm not in high school anymore right um so it, it took me a little while um but i i eventually graduated and uh, when i thought about what i wanted to do i it's, it's actually interesting i got there eventually but i decided to be a teacher because i'm like man these teachers like really hooked me up they took care of me i remember they would keep me after school so i wouldn't have to like you know, be on the streets and hearing those things, seeing those things. They would pour into me, nurture me. They they push me. And um, when I applied for the school education, I got in, I did all my tests. And then they're like, OK, you got to do student teaching. And by the way, we don't pay you to do that. And I'm like, I got a job. Like, I got to work. And I actually dropped out of the school of education mm -hmm. because I couldn't afford to do student teaching without getting paid. So I um, actually just go, went ahead and I graduated with a communications degree, which okay. I mean, it's definitely helped me in my Absolutely. career now. Right. And I actually did an alternative teaching licensing program it's called <laughs> MTech. Oh. And it's like on the job. It's like a residency. They okay. pay you to teach while you're learning to teach. And I had already been a teaching assistant with Milwaukee Public Schools. Okay. Um, you know, my dad hooked me up with his connections and I, I got in. And while I was finishing my college degree, I was working as a teaching assistant at Pierce Elementary School. And then the principal, um, Keith Carrington, um, and he's since um, he's in heaven now. Um, so I, I do want to just acknowledge him. He actually gave me my first teaching job. He said, I would be proud to have you here. I taught fourth grade. Um, and um, then that led me to public office. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I had read um, in an article that um, while you were teaching fourth grade that um, Sometimes you used your paychecks to so to buy supplies Ooh. for the students. Yes. So someone helped you from what you just described, one right. of your teachers, and you definitely paid it forward. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I I had to, and because when I when I got uh, to the classroom, you know, as a teacher, and I was able to do more in depth work with each student and their families, I learned. I'm like, these kids are dealing with far worse than I even dealt with, you know, growing up in my community, whether it was gun violence, domestic violence. I mean, my students were coming to school hungry, you know. And how can you learn when you're you hungry? You can't. It's impossible. And they're expected to meet these, you know, all these tests that we're like shoving down their throats. And, you know, then you got common core going on. Everybody's confused about that. And so it's like, I took it as my opportunity, as you said, to pay it for because those teachers in my in my um, school career didn't hesitate to be generous with their resources. And I have a lot. I mean, uh, at the time, this is before MPS did like some of those raises. We have been in a teaching freeze. I'm sorry, a pay freeze for um, a decade after um, Act 10 had happened and right. they cut public sector unions. So they weren't able to like bargain for wages anymore. I wasn't making a lot. I had student loans. I was paying rent. Um, but I still had more than what my students and my families had. So right. supplies, I would, you know, stock up on snacks, um, clothes even. And the kids, would, I mean, they would sit on my lap. They're like, you're like mm -hmm. my second mom. And and the families, I think, really appreciated um, and felt my my genuine just love right. um, for my students and, and wanting to help them through what they were going through. Yeah, it, it was obvious that you had a passion for the children and, and giving them a stable environment because I think some of the concern was a lot of them didn't have stable housing. Right. They had things going on um, at home and, and coming to school, as you mentioned, um, hungry. How yes. can you learn exactly. when it's like that? Or exactly. different um, domestic violence or other issues going on at home. They needed to have a safe place. Exactly. They needed to feel that safety That's right. so that they can learn. That's right. So, That's right. So as I understand, 
that is when you got engaged with policy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After yeah. those experiences. Yes. Yeah. Tell us about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I didn't grow up in a political family, but you know, I'm sounding like I'm asking these questions out loud to myself. Um, why is why are things still the same? Why has nothing changed? Why has it gotten worse? Who's making these decisions? Who who decided that um, you know, the the curriculum should be taught as it is, as it was? Why was I pigeonholed to what they thought I should be teaching versus what I knew? Um, you know, our students were were at and what they were interested in learning about um, to an extent, because we want to when I say that, I mean, co like culturally competent teaching, making sure that our students see themselves reflected in our curriculum. Like who's making these decisions? Clearly, they don't know anything about our families. They don't know what they're going through. And so um, I actually started organizing and, and like doing rallies and events in the community like backpack giveaway supply giveaways I would you know reach out to folks I'm um, asking for donations to raise supplies um, to give out books you know that sort of thing and it just kept snowballing all of a sudden I find myself I'm yelling at school board you know <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going up to uh, you know the the state capitol um, and uh, then folks started telling me um you know, have you ever thought about running for office? I'm like, heck no. <laughs> what are y'all talking about? I'm poor. Like, you know, no one knows who I am. Who no one knows who I am. Um, I don't even know how this works. I just, you know, I just want to share my perspective because I think it's important. And they're like, well, that's why we need you, you know, at the table. I was gonna say that's exactly why. <sighs> yeah. Um, I still said no. You know, it, mm -hmm. it really, it, it. I was really pushed. Um, by several people. And then when my students, like when their parents and things, because these were like political folks telling me. And then when my family started saying like, you should, you should do it. We'll help you. Like, we got you. We got your back. And, and really they did. Um, they stepped up. I had my students were on my literature. You know, they yes. did uh, photo shoots with me. My parents would knock doors, other teachers, other community members, our bus drivers. I mean, people who were really in entrenched in the community were supporting um, my run for office and um i ran my first race and we started in, in 2015 i was elected in april of 2016 and again two-year terms I've, I've been unopposed since um I, the bug has bit me yeah, yeah yeah i was gonna say because you seem like a natural you just seem very natural with what you're doing and and maybe that's because it kind of came from um the being in the classroom and and um, with an eye on the community and the children and seeing some things that needed to change and what can I do to help make things better. So that is a natural segue into the political arena. Right. All that had sort of like what was killing my confidence, all the things why I felt I wasn't qualified were actually the things that made me most qualified. Right. You know, the fact that I'm from the community, I understand what the challenges are. I understand what people need. I have these relationships, these deep relationships with with children and their families. Um, you know, my organizing I was doing, it really did prepare me. I had no idea it had until I got there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I could do this. Like, <laughs> I ain't going to say that. I ain't going to say what I was just thinking in my head. But it, <laughs> I, I say all this to say, you you be surprised. Um, the the folks that, you know, maybe then, not so much now, because it's we've it, it's changed a lot. The makeup of our elected bodies have changed a lot. But it's like, if they can do it, I can definitely do it. Right. It was really like, you know, what came to mind. And, and all those things that definitely helped with with my policy, you know, whether it was like, you know, fighting to raise wages, um, support, you know, entrepreneurship um, and, and economic development, um, you know, investing in parks, public transportation, advancing racial equity. Right. Um, and, you know, even like this bank resolution um, we're, you know, celebrating tomorrow. Um, all of that is informed by um, the fact that I, I grew up and I love this community. Right, right. I, I know I was reading about um, a comment that you had made um, about being insecure about a lack of what you perceive to be a lack of policy experience. Right. But you turn that around. You yeah. turn that as a strength. Yeah. So that's remarkable. I, I appreciate that. And and definitely the, the educator is, is, is what helps with that. Because, I mean, again, I taught fourth grade. So I had to sort of. Uh, I have to present information in a way that they can understand. Right. And um, I'm learning along the way. And and I again, I'm a nerd. So I would absorb <laughs> as much if I would read everything, all the reports, the policies. I would meet with all the people that I can. And and I, I do something which I, I like to call is democratized knowledge. Um, the reason why so many of us that look like us hadn't been elected before is because there's all this gatekeeping. And we didn't really know the way, the path. And we didn't know the inside. 
And I'm like, well, okay, I'm in it. I'm I've learned I'm learning it. So now I want to share it with everybody. Ah, so that's democratizing. That's knowledge. democratizing. Okay, knowledge. I got it. I got it. <laughs> um, because I know part of what you said too about increasing a skill set um by building strong mentoring relationships yes. and that you challenge yourself to trust your abilities. Absolutely. So yeah, we're certainly glad that you that you've done that. Thank that's you. giving you confidence, managerial skills, confidence in your public facing role and you know you 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 talked about earlier on in your career but I'm looking at you and I'm thinking she's still so young <laughs> you, you've done you've done so much yeah. in a short period of I don't time. feel like it I'll be honest with you so. <laughs> <laughs> not that I you know look age is a I think age is a construct this you know you you I, I love life I, I find joy in life uh, but you know this this work can be taxing and I, I've been doing it eight years now I feel like I've been doing it for 20 years if, if that makes sense um, but but I but I am young. I, I'll be 36 in in June. Um, I was elected. I was 27 years old. Wow. And yeah, and um, 20. I'm going on 28. And um, yeah, I you know our county executive is young. Uh, we're all under 40. Our county right. executive, our mayor. The mayor. Yes. Um, you know, uh, even Caitlin Caitlin Haywood. He was elected at 19. Um, the oh, youngest, yeah, that's right. yep, youngest uh, person ever elected in the country yeah. um, to the state representative, and I really believe it's because we, one, we all grew up in this community. We have stewardship in this community, uh, but we're we were sick and tired of folks who didn't care about us, mm -hmm. didn't really understand the future and what the future holds for us, like making those decisions on our behalf. Um, so I'm, you know, yeah, I guess I'm young relatively, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but hey, that's a good thing. Yeah, that's definitely a good I, thing. I appreciate that. Sure. So um, the notion of politics, because you mentioned that, you know, this can be taxing. It can yeah. be, you know, a little bit hectic at times. And in politics, you will always have your supporters yes. and detractors. Oh, Lord. And you obviously have the support of your constituents. Yes. They elected you. Yes. And then they reelected you. Yes. <laughs> and, and you're on the ballot this April. Unopposed. Unopposed <laughs> on the second. Um, you have the you have won the confidence and the respect of your colleagues, as evidenced by the fact that you are the chairwoman oh, yeah. of the board. Yeah. Um and I'm aware that there was recently yes. an article um, in the journal Sentinel that was critical of you for Very. expensing certain items yes. such as a MAC membership. That's the Milwaukee Athletic yes. Club, I presume, yep. um, with the suggestion being that you expense those items um, to taxpayers inappropriately. Right. So I wanted to give you an opportunity this morning because, you know, the journal Sentinel gets to present its side of things. Right. It's important to give you an opportunity to I appreciate speak to that, that and address that as well. So how would you um, just, you have the opportunity now to elaborate, clarify, Absolutely. respond to that. So so please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And um, I think, what you call them, detractors? I, I did. I call them haters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to yeah. say it in my lawyerly way, but haters. Yeah, yeah you know, and, it. and, and it's unfortunate because I'll just start with this. Um, you know, at Milwaukee County, we're doing a, a lot of, a lot of amazing work and um I, I learned that this was put on the, the the front of the the front page of the sunday paper um I, i'm glad they they thought i was you know worthy of that um but it's you know for instance we're giving you know two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the bank tomorrow why aren't they covering things like that but but i i, I digress um, that's an excellent point, though. I you have know to say. a lot of amazing work <laughs> and that's what they chose to 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 write about um so it, it was incredibly disheartening that that entire process um, because the the article as a whole was largely a mischaracterization, I believe, of of the situation. Um, there were some mistruths, some outright lies um, in the in the um, article, and I do want to dispel some of these things. So um, I'll start with this. Um, this particular journalist, if, if we can, oh, I'm, I'm going to be careful here. Um, this particular person who wrote the article um, was given loads and loads of, of documentation um, and would tie me to these almost impossible deadlines to get things in so they can write that I didn't give comment within the, the article. Um, but I'll talk about some of the particular expenses. So what I do want to first delineate is the article as a whole made it seem like I spent all this money and I outspent all my colleagues and that I was uh, rejecting their expenses so I can spend it up. So I want to be clear that 
as chairwoman of the board of supervisors, I run it as an organization. So um, I pay staff, um, including like chief of staff, off front office interns. I pay county supervisor um, salaries. Um, I also allocate funds to like um, district events. So each supervisor has an account that they spend. Um, I get that myself because I'm still a county supervisor for District 10. And we have rules in place um, at Milwaukee County. We can't just spend money on anything. We have to submit and those things get approved. So I did not outspend um, my supervisors, my colleagues. And then I have a chairperson account as a whole, as an organization. So for instance, if you see us at Juneteenth, which you have, and we're walking in a parade and we're holding a banner or we have a booth set up, I pay out of that central account. But she lumped all that money together and didn't make the, the delineation that I have an account and then I have a chairperson account that's for the whole board. So I did not outspend my, my colleagues. Now, um, with things, particular expenses, and I, I want to get on, touch on a few of those. Um, for the Milwaukee Athletic Club, for example, I turned over to her other examples of memberships. Um, this is not unheard of um, in government. There are folks who are members of CPA organizations, Black administrator organizations, Tempo. That's a um, like a private uh, women's club sure. that also holds events and has social opportunities. So, um, and I also didn't expense my entire membership. I'm still a member, by the way. You know, the county is not paying for it. Um, but at the time, I also turned over documentation that the the months that I did expense, I was doing civic engagement work. So um, we were doing something at the time uh, around the sales tax, and we were trying to um, engage as many people as possible. And, you know, folks like me, I don't have access to, I'll be quite frank, a lot of rich white people. And th that's who was at that, that club. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to go in and bridge gaps, um, build relationships with folks who would actually have a stake in helping us um, past that so we could get the funds we needed to provide these services. I provided um, um, my calendar. So she saw I held meetings, roundtables. I brought in the mayor, county executive, uh, the Greater Milwaukee Committee, and so forth. Um, and we would have a, a attendance list and people would learn about Milwaukee County while we needed this. And they would go lobby um, the state legislature. And the county was able to implement a 0.4% sales tax for su suburban communities because the city had their own sales tax. And it's raising $84 million um, in revenue. For the first time, we have a budget surplus at Milwaukee County. None of that was added in the article either, right? Right. Okay. So, you know, and, and then I told her, okay, that was just for that time. My staff was helping me build those um, events and everyone was grateful and glad that I did it. Um, so I did want to just put that on the table that that is what that particular situation was about. Uh, but then she threw in some some other things, you know, talking about roller skates. So, again, with the $50 roller skates, um, Red Arrow Park in downtown Milwaukee now has a roller skating rink. Um, they have a roller skating series. I actually um, implemented that policy at Milwaukee County. Right. Um, and that and I and I did get those some purple skates. Um, okay. I did get those to to skate with them, skate with the community. We did a, a community event at the courthouse in Red Arrow Park. Um, and you won't see me, you won't see me riding those at, at Butler or anything like that. It wasn't for my own personal use. It was for um to promote that policy to do work um to raise awareness and it didn't actually get a lot of attention until she talked about it in right. in the article. So so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm glad to give you the opportunity to provide context yes. for these things yes. because that's important. Yes. That it's not just a one sided commentary. Exactly. So I, I know that I hear the music playing, so I know we've got to take a break. We'll and we're going to come back and, and have a little more Absolutely. to say about all of this. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, we'll be right back. Thank you. Milwaukee, we are about to enter one of the most important election seasons of our lives. 2024 is going to be pivotal. Here at WNOV, we work to ensure that our listeners are informed, knowledgeable, and engaged. On Tuesday, April 2nd, tune in from 3 to 8 p.m. for another edition of Election Central. Hear from candidates, discuss ballot referendums, and get real-time election updates and report problems throughout the course of the day. We are ready, and you should be too. Election Central on WNOV 860 AM 106.5 FM, sponsored by Souls to the Pulse. 
a.k.a. Milwaukee, you're ready for a breath of fresh air with Community Heartbeat, your go-to show for health and wellness in our vibrant city. Tune in the last Friday of every month to join us on a journey toward a healthier Milwaukee. Community Heartbeat is not just a show. It's a movement dedicated to bringing our community together through wellness. Call in during our live show the last Friday of every month from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Share your thoughts on social media using hashtag Community Heartbeat and let's build a healthier Milwaukee together. Milwaukee, this is Michelle Bryant, your host of Say Something Real. When President Joe Biden wanted to talk to Milwaukee voters, he called WNOV. And welcome, uh, President Biden, to Milwaukee and to WNOV. How you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. I had a great event downtown, and I'm at the headquarters now. And uh, we're feeling really good. It's a great day. We have a lot of volunteers. We have a thousand volunteers going out here in, in Wisconsin, out of Milwaukee in particular. So we are ready to roll in Wisconsin. Well, I'll tell you what, God love you. <laughs> For up-to-date election information, keep it locked on WNOV, 860 AM, 106.5 FM. If you're looking for mouth-watering eats and delectable treats, look no further. Eat local and visit the Sherman Phoenix today, where you can find everything from delicious organic wings and smoked barbecue to satisfyingly seasoned vegan food to sweet, buttery, made-to-order desserts. The Sherman Phoenix is also home to a day bar, serving mixed, frozen, and tropical drinks. Experience the Sherman Phoenix effect at 3536 West Fond du Lac Avenue, open Tuesday through Friday, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., and Saturday, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Visit thesshermanphoenix.com to learn more. Hey, Milwaukee, this is Mandela Barnes. You probably know me as the former lieutenant governor, but I'm also a proud product of Milwaukee Public Schools and a proud son of a Milwaukee public school teacher. And that's why I'm supporting Yes for MPS. We have strong public schools. We have strong communities. We have a strong workforce. And everyone can succeed. For years, we've seen Republicans in the legislature continue to fail Milwaukee students by withholding resources that force devastating cuts to our schools. This referendum is our chance to stand up for our kids and provide them with the opportunities they deserve and say yes to their futures when so many have told them no. If the referendum fails, consequences for our children, our parents, our educators, and for the future of our city will be dire. So let's do our part, Milwaukee. Join me in voting yes for MPS on April 2nd. Paid for by the Vote Yes for MPS Committee. You're listening to WNOV 860 and W293CX 106.5 Milwaukee. Okay, so we're back in the studio with the uh, Madam Chair of the County Board, um, Marcelia Nicholson, and you were um, just making some comments regarding that recent Journal Sentinel article, yeah. and I'd like to give you an opportunity to finish those remarks. Yeah, Go thank ahead, you. Please. Thank you so much. So I, I think I left off on the skates, but but what I also didn't appreciate was she took the the opinion and, and the, the, the comments of two white men. Um, into account over mine did not give me a chance to respond um, to their comments. And, and what I would have told her was um, the reason why their um, expenditures were rejected was because they weren't following, you know, the protocols as it related to our travel policies that they had, including one who wanted to take a flight and told us the night before and his flight took off at 6.45 a.m. But my staff worked overtime to make sure um, that he could do that. Um, I also wanted to touch on, there's just some really petty stuff in there, including I had purchased a booster seat. Um, I do want to say this, because this is important. I'm 5'4". My predecessor was 6'7". And that diocese that I sit at to preside over those board meetings was not built for me to sit at. <laughs> and I can't see over that little table. So I got a booster seat. Uh, what also wasn't mentioned was... Um, while I do get a salary, it's a part-time salary from the Milwaukee County Board. I don't receive health and benefits or anything like that. Um, and it's quite frankly, for me, a, a sacrifice. I have to work a full-time job on top of that. And so um, I just wanted to also say that, you know, for me, um, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that folks understood that I'm not out here, you know, spending up money, that I'm really doing my best. And, and I want to continue to represent folks in, in the best way I know how. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And as a fellow five foot four yes, person, yes, I understand that yes. you got to make some allowances in the world. Um, 
So again, I'm glad to have you here today. It sounds like from everything we've talk about, talked about that your mission yes. in the board aligns with this bank's mission in the community. And you've put your money, literally yes. your money, where the mouth is. And now you have brought it about so that the county could put yes. some money um, where the mouth is as well. So again, thank you for supporting Columbia Savings and Loan. Um, there will be a press conference at the bank tomorrow. The county executive, David Crawley, yes. will also be present, as I understand, um, to present um, Columbia with this $250,000 check to show its support uh, for the campaign to put 100 families in their own homes in honor of Columbia's 100th year of service to the community. Thank you again for joining us. If you have any final words. No, thank y'all. You, you know where to find me. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. So we're going to look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Money Talks with Attorney Coral, sponsored by Columbia Savings and Loan.